Once upon a time there was a youth called Moti, who was very big and strong, but the clumsiest creature you can imagine. So clumsy was he that he was always putting his great feet into the bowls of sweet milk or curds which his mother set out on the floor to cool, always smashing, upsetting, breaking, until at last his father said to him, Here, Moti, are fifty silver pieces, which are the savings of years. Take them and go, and make your living or your fortune if you can. Then Moti started off one early spring morning with his thick staff over his shoulder, singing gaily to himself as he walked along. In one way or another he got along very well until a hot evening when he came to a certain city where he entered the traveller's serai, or inn, to pass the night. Now a serai, you must know, is generally just a large square, enclosed by a high wall, with an open colonnade along the inside all round, to accommodate both men and beasts, and with perhaps a few rooms in towers at the corners for those who are too rich or too proud to care about sleeping by their own camels and horses. Moti, of course, was a country lad, and had lived with cattle all of his life, and he wasn't rich, and he wasn't proud. So he just borrowed a bed from the innkeeper, set it down beside an old buffalo who reminded him of home, and in five minutes was fast asleep. In the middle of the night he woke, feeling that he had been disturbed, and putting his hand under his pillow, found to his horror that his bag of money had been stolen. He jumped up quietly and began to prowl around to see whether anyone seemed to be awake, but— though he managed to arouse a few men and beasts by falling over them, he walked in the shadows of the archways round the whole serai without coming across a likely thief. He was just about to give it up when he overheard two men whispering, and one laughed softly, and peering behind a pillar he saw two Afghan horse-dealers counting out his bag of money. Then Moti went back to bed. In the morning Moti followed the two Afghans outside the city to the horse-market, in which their horses were offered for sale. Choosing the best-looking horse amongst them, he went up to it and said, "'Is this horse for sale? May I try it?' And the merchants, assenting, he scrambled up onto its back, dug in his heels, and off they flew." Now Moti had never been on a horse in his life, and had so much ado to hold on with both hands as well as with both legs that the animal just went where it liked, and very soon broke into a breakneck gallop and made straight back to the serai where it had spent the last few nights. This will do very well, thought Moti, as they whirled in at the entrance. As soon as the horse had arrived at its table, it stopped of its own accord, and Moti immediately rolled off. But he jumped up at once, tied the beast up, and called for some breakfast. Presently the Afghans appeared, out of breath and furious, and claimed the horse. "'What do you mean?' cried Moti, with his mouth full of rice. "'It's my horse. I paid you fifty pieces of silver for it. Quite a bargain, I'm sure.' "'Nonsense! It is our horse!' answered one of the Afghans, beginning to untie the bridle. "'Leave off!' shouted Moti, seizing his staff. "'And if you don't let my horse alone, I'll crack your skulls, you thieves! I know you! Last night you took my money, so today I took your horse. That's fair enough!' Now the Afghans began to look a little uncomfortable, but Moti seemed so determined to keep the horse that they resolved to appeal to the law. So they went off and laid a complaint before the king that Moti had stolen one of their horses and would not give it up nor pay for it. Presently a soldier came to summon Moti to the king, and when he arrived and made his obeisance, the king began to question him as to why he had galloped off with the horse in this fashion. But Moti declared that he had got the animal in exchange for fifty pieces of silver, whilst the horse-merchants vowed that the money they had on them was what they had received for the sale of other horses, and in one way or another the dispute got so confusing that the king, who really thought that Moti had stolen the horse, said at last, "'Well, I tell you what I will do. I will lock something into this box before me, and if he guesses what it is, the horse is his. 
and if he doesn't, then it is yours. To this Moti agreed, and the king arose and went out alone by a little door at the back of the court, and presently came back, clasping something closely wrapped up in a cloth under his robe, and slipped it into the little box, locked the box, and set it up where all might see. Now, said the king to Moti, guess! It had happened that when the king had opened the door behind him, Moti had noticed that there was a garden outside. Without waiting for the king's return, he began to think what could be got out of the garden small enough to be shut in the box. Is it likely to be a fruit or a flower? No, not a flower this time, for he clasped it too tight. Then it must be a fruit or a stone. Yet not a stone, because he wouldn't wrap a dirty stone in his nice clean cloth. Then it is a fruit, and a fruit without much scent, or else he would be afraid that I might smell it. Now what fruit without much scent is in season just now? When I know that, I shall have guessed the riddle. As has been said before, Moti was a country lad, and was accustomed to work in his father's gardens. He knew all the common fruits, so he thought he ought to be able to guess right. But so as not to let it seem too easy, he gazed up at the ceiling with a puzzled expression, and looked down at the floor with an air of wisdom, and his fingers pressed against his forehead, and then he said slowly, with his eyes on the king, "'It is freshly plucked. It is round, and it is red. It is a pomegranate!' Now the king knew nothing about fruits, except that they were good to eat, and as for seasons, he asked for whatever fruit he wanted whenever he wanted it, and saw that he got it. So to him Moti's guess was like a miracle, and clear proof not only of his wisdom, but of his innocence, for it was a pomegranate that he had put into the box. Of course, when the king marvelled and praised Moti's wisdom, everybody else did so too, and whilst the Afghans went off crestfallen, Moti took the horse and entered the king's service. Very soon after this, Moti, who continued to live in the Serai, came back one wet and stormy evening to find that his precious horse had strayed. Nothing remained of him but a broken halter cord, and no one knew what had become of him. After inquiring of every one who was likely to know, Moti seized the cord and his big staff and sallied out to look for him. Away and away he tramped out of the city and into the neighboring forest, tracking hoof-marks in the mud. Presently it grew late, but still Moti wandered on until suddenly, in the gathering darkness, he came right upon a tiger who was contentedly eating his horse. "'You thief!' shrieked Moti, and ran up, and just as the tiger, in astonishment, dropped a bone, whack! came Moti's staff on his head, with such good will that the beast was half stunned and could hardly breathe or see. Then Moti continued to shower upon him blows and abuse, until the poor tiger could hardly stand, whereupon his tormentor tied the end of the broken halter round his neck and dragged him back to the serai. "'If you have had my horse,' he said, I will at least have you. That's fair enough. And he tied him up securely, by the head and heels, much as he used to tie the horse. Then, the night being far gone, he flung himself beside him, and slept soundly. You cannot imagine anything like the fright of the people in the Serai when they woke up and found a tiger, very battered, but still a tiger, securely tethered amongst themselves and their beasts. Men gathered in groups, talking and exclaiming, and finding fault with the innkeeper for allowing such a dangerous beast into the serai, and all the while the innkeeper was just as troubled as the rest, and none dared go near the place, where the tiger stood blinking miserably on every one, and where Moti lay stretched out, snoring like thunder. At last news reached the king— that Moti had exchanged his horse for a live tiger, and the monarch himself came down, half disbelieving the tale, to see if it were really true. Some one at last awaked Moti with the news that his royal master was come, and he arose yawning, and was soon delightedly explaining and showing off his new possession. 
The king, however, did not share his pleasure at all, but called up a soldier to shoot the tiger, much to the relief of all the inmates of the serai except Moti. If the king, however, was before convinced that Moti was one of the wisest of men, he was now still more convinced that he was the bravest, and he increased his pay a hundredfold, so that our hero thought he was the luckiest of men. A week or two after this incident the king sent for Moti, who on arrival found his master in despair. A neighboring monarch, he explained, who had many more soldiers than he, had declared war against him, and he was at his wit's end, for he had neither money to buy him off, nor soldiers enough to fight him. What was he to do? "'If that's all, don't you trouble,' said Moti. "'Turn out your men, and I'll go with them, and we'll soon bring this robber to reason.' The king began to revive at these hopeful words, and took Moti off to his stable, where he bade him choose for himself any horse he liked. There were plenty of fine horses in the stalls, but to the king's astonishment Moti chose a poor little rat of a pony that used to carry grass and water for the rest of the stable. "'But why do you choose that beast?' said the king. "'Well, you see, Your Majesty,' replied Moti, "'there are so many chances that I may fall off, and if I choose one of your fine big horses, I shall have so far to fall that I shall probably break my leg or my arm, if not my neck, but if I fall off this little beast I can't hurt myself much.' A very comical sight was Moti when he rode out to the war. The only weapon he carried was his staff, and to help him keep his balance on horseback he had tied to each of his ankles a big stone that nearly touched the ground as he sat astride the little pony. The rest of the king's cavalry were not very numerous, but they pranced along in armor on fine horses. Behind them came a great rabble of men on foot armed with all sorts of weapons, and last of all was the king with his attendants, very nervous and ill at ease. So the army started. They had not very far to go, but Moti's little pony, weighted with a heavy man and two big rocks, soon began to lag behind the cavalry, and would have lagged behind the infantry too, only they were not very anxious to be too early in the fight and hung back so as to give Moti plenty of time. The young man jogged along more and more slowly for some time, until at last, getting impatient at the slowness of the pony, he gave him such a tremendous thwack with his staff that the pony completely lost his temper and bolted. First one stone became untied and rolled away in a cloud of dust to one side of the road, whilst Moti nearly rolled off too, but clasped his steed valiantly by its ragged mane, and dropping his staff, held on for dear life. Then, fortunately, the other rock broke away from his other leg, and rolled thunderously down a neighboring ravine. Meanwhile, the advanced cavalry had barely time to draw to one side, when Moti came dashing by, yelling bloodthirsty threats to his pony. "'You wait till I get a hold of you! I'll skin you alive! I'll wring your neck! I'll break every bone in your body!' The cavalry thought that this dreadful language was meant for the enemy, and they were filled with admiration of his courage. Many of their horses, too, were quite upset by this whirlwind that galloped howling through their midst, and in a few minutes, after a little plunging and rearing and kicking, the whole troop were following on Moti's heels. Far in advance Moti continued his wild career. Presently, in his course, he came to a great field of castor-oil plants, ten or twelve feet high, big and bushy, but quite green and soft. Hoping to escape from the back of his fiery steed, Moti grasped one in passing, but its roots gave way, and he dashed on, with the whole plant looking like a young tree flourishing in his grip. The enemy were in battle array, advancing over the plain, their king with them confident and cheerful, when suddenly from the front came a desperate rider at a furious gallop. "'Sire!' he cried. "'Save yourself! The enemy are coming!' "'What do you mean?' said the king. "'Oh, sire!' panted the messenger. "'Fly at once! There is no time to lose!' 
foremost of the enemy rides a mad giant at a furious gallop. He flourishes a tree for a club, and is wild with anger, for as he goes he cries, You wait till I get a hold of you. I'll skin you alive. I'll wring your neck. I'll break every bone in your body. Others ride behind, and you will do well to retire before this whirlwind of destruction comes upon you. Just then, out of a cloud of dust in the distance, the king saw Moti approaching at a hard gallop, looking, indeed, like a giant compared with the little beast he rode, whirling his castor-oil plant, which in the distance might have been an oak tree, and the sound of his revilings and shoutings came down upon the breeze. Behind him the dust-cloud moved to the sound of the thunder and hoofs, whilst here and there flashed the glitter of steel. The sight and the sound struck terror into the king, and turning his horse he fled at top speed, thinking that a regiment of yelling giants was upon him, and all his force followed him as fast as they might go. One fat officer alone could not keep up on foot with that mad rush, and as Moti came galloping up, he flung himself on the ground in abject fear. This was too much for Moti's excited pony, who shied so suddenly that Moti went flying over his head like a sky-rocket, and alighted right on top of his fat foe. Quickly regaining his feet, Moti began to swing his plant round his head and to shout, "'Where are you men? Bring them up, and I'll kill them! My regiments! Come on, the whole lot of you! Where is your king? Bring him to me!' Here are all my fine fellows coming up, and we'll each pull a tree by the roots and lay you all flat in your houses and towns and everything else. Come on! But the poor fat officer could do nothing but squat on his knees with his hands together, gasping. At last, when he had got his breath, Moti sent him off to bring his king, and to tell him that, if he was reasonable, his life should be spared. Off the poor man went, and by the time the troops of Moti's side had come up and arranged themselves to look as formidable as possible, he returned with his king. The latter was very humble and apologetic, and promised never to make war any more, to pay a large sum of money, and altogether to do whatever his conqueror wished. So the armies on both sides went rejoicing home, and this was really the making of the fortune of clumsy Moti who lived long and contrived always to be looked up to as a fountain of wisdom, valour, and discretion by all except his relations, who could never understand what he had done to be considered so much wiser than any one else. A Push-To-Tale End of Chapter